entire ten. So we're going to have a look at the written questions of your work, energy, power and momentum paper now. So question 11 on the paper said, state and explain one advantage, so a good thing, and one disadvantage, a bad thing, of heating the water in a solar panel. This bit is crucial. Some of you really misread the question. So it's asking for an advantage and a disadvantage of heating via the solar panel. So at all times, we want to be talking about why the solar panel is good or why the solar panel is bad. Okay. We use the coal as a comparison, but we're not talking about the advantages and disadvantages of coal. Okay, so one of the options you could have said for your advantage is that the solar panel is a renewable source. We can always capture energy from the sun, whereas coal will always run out. So that's why solar is an advantage compared to a coal uh, burning boiler. A disadvantage of a solar panel in comparison to a coal burning boiler is that they are expensive to install whereas homes are generally already set up to receive power from um, power stations which generally run off coal. You could also have said for an advantage a good thing that solar panels do not emit greenhouse gases whereas coal power stations um, do so solar power is better for the environment in comparison to coal. Or, as another disadvantage, you could have said that solar power is not produced at night time um, or during poor weather conditions, so where the light level is low, whereas a coal power station um, is able to produce energy for homes whenever it's needed. So those were your main options that you could have said. Um, but really think about how you're phrasing your answers and make sure that you're focusing on why the solar panel is good or bad, not why the coal is good or bad. You have to make the comparison, but the focus needs to be on the solar panel. Okay, so question 12 um, was, was done okay, but there are a few of you that got yourselves really mixed up here. So the boxes on the left contain the names of some sources of energy. The boxes on the right contain properties. So draw two straight lines they even bolded for you from each box on the left to two boxes on the right. Some of you highlighted the draw two straight lines and only drew two total. Two from each box to two on the right. So, solar energy we know is renewable. It does not emit greenhouse gases, so it's not polluting. Natural gas is gas trapped um, under a surface that we harness, we capture, it's not renewable. Once it runs out, we're not getting any more in our lifetime. It is polluting, okay? When we use that natural gas, we are emitting greenhouse gases into the environment. That is polluting. In B, it asks you to state an advantage of using coal as a source of energy. So you could have said that it's widely available at the moment. It's relatively cheap, and it can be used at any time. In part C... It talks about a coal-powered fire sta uh, a coal-fired power station, sorry, and it generates electricity at night when it is not needed. Some of this energy is stored by pumping water up to a mountain lake. When there is a high demand for electricity, the water is allowed to flow back through the turbines. On one occasion, 2.05 times 10 to the 8 kilograms of water is pumped through a vertical height. That's important of 500 meters. Firstly, it asks you to calculate the weight of the water. This was done surprisingly badly. Weight, remember, is just the mass multiplied by 10 because it's the mass multiplied by G. And that's a number you were expected to remember um, in our last topic. So here's our mass, here's G. We multiply them together and we get 2.05 times 10 to the 9 newtons. Um, lots of you were writing out all of the zeros. You don't need to do that. You can write it in standard form. Save yourself some time, and it'll also make you less likely to make a mistake. It then goes on to ask you to calculate the gravitational potential energy gained by the water. Loads of you just didn't even bother writing the equation. It's really silly, because if you make a mistake with the numbers, I can't give you any marks. 
but if you write the equation down, I can give you one to show you understood what you were supposed to do. You just misread the numbers. So please get into the habit of writing this equation down. So gravitational potential energy is given by mgh, mass times gravity times height. The mass, you were told, here, okay? That's in kilograms, that's a mass. G is just 10, and the height it moved through was 500 meters, okay? When I plug that into my calculator, I get my final answer of 1.025 times 10 to the 12 joules, okay? It's as simple as that. The next part, the last part of the question, says, okay, well, we had to use electrical energy to pump the water up to the top of the mountain, okay? And we're told that that required 1.2 times 10 to the 12 joules, okay? That was getting the water up at the top of the mountain in the first place so that we could reuse it at a later stage. So if you imagine, the water's now been pumped up to the top through a pipe, it's now being stored up here, and then when we then need to use it, when it's not night time, when we need energy in the daytime, the water flows down, passes through a turbine, this spins round, and it's connected to a generator, and it produces electricity, okay? What we're being told is that it required 1.2 times 10 to the 12 joules to get the water up there, but when we then used it later, and let it flow back down, we only got 6.2 times 10 to the 11 joules of energy out when the water was released. And it asks you to calculate the efficiency of the energy storage system. Again, lots of you didn't write the equation. So efficiency is useful energy output compared to the total energy input. And if we want it as a percentage, we multiply by 100. Well, the useful output is the electrical energy that we generate once we release the water. The total energy input was the energy required to get the water to go up to the top of the mountain. We then multiply that by 100 and we see that we get around 52%, okay, to two significant figures, or 51.6% would have been fine. You could also have left it in a decimal no number, that would also have been fine. Okay, question 13 then. You've got a forklift truck lifting a box. The electric motor that drives it is powered by batteries. State the form of the energy stored in the batteries. Lots of you wrote electrical, now that is wrong. So if you think about what your battery is doing, when it's connected into a circuit, it allows electricity to flow. Okay, so that's when it's flowing. We get energy from the battery being transferred to electrical energy as it then gets transferred away through the components. But if we just have the battery by itself sat in a drawer, there's no electricity flow, there's no current flow. So there's a store of energy inside here. So the battery acid, the liquid inside of the battery, has a store of chemical energy. That's something that you need to remember. In part B, it, we're told that we raise the box, which has a mass of 32 kilograms, through a vertical distance. That's important because that tells us the height that it has moved through of 2.5 meters in 5.4 seconds. So we have H is 2.5, and we have T is 5.4, and we have mass is 32. Um, and that's kilograms. So calculate the gravitational potential energy. So again, GPE is MGH, mass is 32, G is 10, H is the vertical distance, it's 2.5. When we multiply those together, we get 800 joules. Now, the efficiency, this next bit is a bit trickier. The efficiency of the lifting mechanism is 0.65%, uh, sorry, 0.65 or 65%, so decimal value of efficiency or the percentage. And it says, okay, well, calculate the input power to the lifting mechanism. That bit that says power is very, very important because it means that when we use our efficiency equation, we have to be looking at the power, not the energy input. 
Okay, now we know that when we lift, the, we are going to be using the gravitational potential energy. Okay, so we know that this is the useful power outputs energy input. So I'm going to take this 800 joules. This is the useful energy gained because the whole point is we're trying to lift the box. Okay, and it has to gain that if it moves through a height of 2.5 meters. We just worked that out. Now we know that power, let me do this in another color, is energy transferred divided by time taken. Okay, so if I want to convert my useful energy to be a useful power, I need to divide the energy gained by the time it took. So I take my 800 joules of useful energy and I divide it by the time it took to do that, which I'm shown up here. And that will give me my useful power output. The input power is what I'm trying to calculate, so I don't know this number, but I'm told that the ratio of the useful power out compared to the total power in is 0.65. Okay, so if I just zoom down here, I've rearranged my equation to say, well, okay, well, my total power input is my useful power output divided by my efficiency. Okay, and I will get my value of 227.9 watts, and I have rounded that up to 230 watts. Okay, so just be careful because you may have mixed up energy and power there. So, in part C, the batteries are recharged from a mains voltage supply that is generated in an oil-fired power station. By comparison with a wind farm, so you have to reference wind, but the question again says state one advantage, a good thing, and one disadvantage, a bad thing, of running a power station using oil. So it has to be that the focus is on oil. So, an advantage. Oil is not dependent on the weather. Okay, so energy can always be harnessed. This is why oil is better than wind, because remember, we have to make a comparison to a wind farm. Okay, so it's the fact that it's always available. I don't want you to be talking about efficiency, because different power stations have different efficiencies, and actually coal, oil, and natural gas power stations are not really very efficient. So coal power stations and oil power stations are only between 40 and 60% efficient. That's, that's not one you want to focus on. Okay, so talk about the weather, please. So a disadvantage of an oil power station is that they will emit greenhouse gases, whereas wind doesn't, or oil is a non-renewable energy source, whereas wind is. Okay. Question 14 then looks at uh, kinetic energy to start with. So it says, a rifle fires a bullet of mass 0.02 kilograms vertically up through the air. That's important. As it leaves the rifle, the speed of the bullet is 350 meters per second. Calculate the kinetic energy of the bullet as it leaves the rifle. Okay, well, we're told the speed that it leaves. Kinetic energy is found by a half mv squared, so a half multiplied by the mass m is 0.02, multiplied by v squared, velocity squared is speed squared in this case, it's 350 squared, we get 1225 joules. So we know that at the instant the bullet leaves, it has 1225 joules of kinetic energy. Okay, and then it's going to travel vertically upwards. As it does so, it's going to slow down, okay, because gravity is acting against it, its weight pulls it down, it, it decelerates, it slows down, and it will reach some high point. Okay, once it reaches its highest point, it's temporarily not moving, it's slowed down to zero meters per second. So at this point, it has zero joules of kinetic energy. Okay, so we know that as it travels up, the kinetic energy decreases. It had maximum kinetic energy at the instant it left the rifle. In the next part of the question, it asks you to find that maximum possible height that it can reach. 
So we've said, okay, well at the highest point, it's not moving, it has zero meters per second, it has no kinetic energy. So that must mean that all of the kinetic energy was transferred to gravitational potential energy because it's gaining in height. If height increases, gravitational potential energy does too. So the kinetic energy at the start equals the gravitational potential energy at the top. We've just worked out that that value was 1225. Okay, so I'm going to take this bit. I am looking to find an answer for the height. So I want H. So H must be this value divided by mg. And when I do that, I get 6,125 metres. That's for two marks. In the next bit, though, it says, OK, but the actual height reached by the bullet is actually going to be less than the value that we've just calculated. We're not really, in reality, going to be able to reach that. Explain, and this next bit is crucial, in terms of the forces acting on the bullet, why this is so. This means that you have to talk about forces in your answer, and if you don't, you're not going to get any marks. So, first things first, is we explain that this assumed that all of the energy was transferred to gravitational potential energy. Whereas in reality, there's going to be some energy loss to the surroundings because there's air resistance. Okay, But we're not talking about the energy loss, we're talking about the forces. Air resistance is a force. There is air resistance acting downwards to consider. Okay, so the bullet's moving up, but there's air resistance moving down. This adds to the weight of the bullet. So if you think about what the force diagram would look like, if this is your bullet and it's travelling upwards, we know that it has a weight, which is mass multiplied by gravity, and if it's travelling up, there's also air resistance pushing down. Okay, now the weight plus the air resistance gives us the resultant force on the bullet. Okay, so we've got W plus, I'll put R for air resistance. Okay, the resultant force is now bigger. There's more force down because of the air resistance that we didn't consider before. That acts against the direction the bullet travels in, so it's going to cause the bullet to slow down. So, we've got air resistance to consider. This adds to the weight of the bullet, and the resultant force downwards increases. This causes the bullet's deceleration to increase. If it's decelerating more, it's slowing down more at a rapid pace, okay? And so it's going to come to a stop sooner because of the higher deceleration. If it comes to a stop sooner, it doesn't reach as high a point. So that's why the height is actually less. Okay, almost last question. 15 then, complete figure 2.1 by writing in the right hand column the name of the quantity that we get when we look at these products. So mass is M as a symbol in physics, acceleration is A, if you do that, it might help you remember the equation, F equals MA. F stands for force, so when we multiply these two, we get force. Force multiplied by time is impulse, okay? But is also equal to change in momentum, okay? So we, we know that change in momentum, final momentum minus initial momentum, is equal to force multiplied by time. You just need to remember these things, please. Okay, figure 2.2 shows a man hitting a ball with a golf club. The ball has a mass of 0 0.046 kilograms. It's in contact with the ball, the golf club, sorry, um, is in contact with the ball for 5 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds, and the ball leaves the golf club at a speed of 65 metres per second. Well, clearly, the ball, when it's just sat on its tee, doesn't have any velocity, it's, st it's stationary. Okay, but we're interested in finding the momentum as it leaves the golf club. Okay, momentum is mass multiplied by velocity. The mass is constant, it's 0 0.046. The velocity 
at the point where it leaves the golf club is 65. So I multiply these two together and I get 2.99 kilogram meters per second because kilograms is the unit of mass, meters per second is the unit of velocity and we're multiplying those together. In part two, it asks you to find the average resultant force acting on the ball while in contact with the golf club. So, FT, we've had up here, is impulse. This is a bit of a clue that we're going to use these things in our answer. Force times time is impulse. Impulse is also change in momentum. Okay, so let's go back down here. Force multiplied by time is impulse is change in momentum. This is the final momentum. This is the initial momentum. So the difference is the change. I'm going to rearrange this equation. So FT equals MV minus MU. If I divide both sides of the equation by T, I get rid of the T here, and I now introduce a divided by T on the right-hand side. Okay, so I get force is change in momentum over time taken. We've just worked out that the momentum as it leaves is this value. And we know that initially the golf ball didn't have any momentum because it was sat on the tee not moving. And we're told that the time that the golf club is in contact with the ball is 5 times 10 to the minus 4. So I plug that all in. And when you do that on your calculator, you'll get 5,980 newtons. While a golf club is in contact with the ball, the ball becomes compressed, okay, so squishes up. So it goes from being perfectly round to actually having a bit of a compression. So if you imagine that's like the golf club head, this bit gets squashed in a little bit. State the type of energy stored during the contact. Well, if it's compressing and changing shape, that is an elastic potential energy. So remember, if we have a spring and it is either stretched or compressed, so stretched out or made smaller than its original shape, if it changes shape, we get elastic potential energy. This applies to any object, not just springs. Okay, final question then, here we go. So we've got question 16, we've got a waterfall. Describe the main energy transfer taking place as the water falls. Okay, that's the crucial bit here. It's about the fact that the water is falling. So if it is falling, its height is decreasing. That means its gravitational potential energy is decreasing. We know that that energy has to be going somewhere. The water speeds up because it's accelerating due to gravity, so it must be gaining kinetic energy. The fact that it asks for the transfer means you have to say what it was and what it goes to. You can't just list one type of energy. Transfer means change, okay? So what change is taking place? Gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy. Last but not least, this is a tricky one. It says the speed of the water as it hits the bottom is 21 meters per second. Calculate the height of the waterfall. Well, we just said that the gravitational potential energy at the top of the waterfall converts to the kinetic energy at the bottom of the waterfall. So we can say that these two things are equal. This at the top equals this at the bottom. The value is the same. There's mass on both sides of the equation, so I can cancel. MGH equals a half mv squared. We have m on both sides. They're the same mass, so we don't need to consider them. We can get rid of them. That tells us that GH is equal to a half V squared. If I multiply both sides by 2, I get V squared equals 2GH. Now, in some questions, it might ask you to calculate the speed at the bottom if it falls through a height, in which case you would then square root and get V equals root 2GH. That's a helpful thing to be aware of. But we're not asked for that in this case. We're asked for the height. We know that V squared is now 2GH because we've taken it from the red equation. I need H, so I'm going to rearrange and say, well, that must mean that H is equal to V squared divided by 2G. We're told that V, the speed at the bottom, is 21 metres per second. 
don't forget to square it. 2 is just 2. G is 10. That gives me 441 over 20, which gives me a height of 22 metres.